Continuing on with Chapter 10, we're looking at the continuation of the U.S. government under the U.S. Constitution. Now, where we left off in Part 1, we were looking at Alexander Hamilton's policies as Secretary of the Treasury, specifically his focus on paying off the national debt that had been created during the American Revolution and honestly during the uh, Articles of Confederation time as well. Um, Part of his plan was obviously focusing on creating tariffs and an excise tax in order to pay off this debt. The crown jewel of Alexander Hamilton's plan was to create a Bank of the United States. Now this was based on the British model who had a similar bank. This would be a centralized bank, uh, a private bank, but a centralized bank nonetheless where the United States government would be the number one shareholder in this private bank. Now, all treasury deposits, all surpluses would be put into an account at this Bank of the United States. Other people could also invest in the Bank of the United States, etc. Now, the reason behind putting this money in a private bank was because he felt that if there is ever going to be a surplus in the U.S. Uh, government's um, money and we put it in the bank. Now that bank will then loan that money out uh, to people through mortgages, uh, uh, farm loans, etc., etc. So it ensures that the money stays in circulation, meaning that money uh, is going to stay fluid. The economy is going to keep flowing. This is an important idea. Banks do this today. When you put your money into a bank, it's not sitting in a locked box somewhere. It's being utilized in the economy. The bank then turns around and uses it to give out car loans or mortgages or whatnot, and thus the economy stays fluid. People can start businesses. They can buy homes. They can buy small uh, farms, etc. So this was Hamilton's idea to keep the money uh, in circulation, to keep the money flowing. He also wanted to create one stable, uniform currency. He wanted to do away with all the states to making their own currency in order to ensure that the Treasury Department had strict control over this. Now, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who had a completely different idea of how the United States should be run, uh, looked at the Bank of the United States as a terrible idea. Um, from Jefferson's perspective, who focused on strict or little, literal construction of the U.S. Constitution, he said, where is it written in the U.S. Constitution that we can create a Bank of the United States? If it is not specifically written into the U.S. Constitution, then this is something that should be reserved to the states. The U.S. government has no business creating a Bank of the United States. Now, from Hamilton's perspective, who believed in a loose or broad interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, he said that the Constitution, there is a clause in the U.S. Constitution that gives Congress the power uh, to make laws that are necessary and proper to the governing of the United States. So Congress can collect taxes, Congress can regulate trade between the states. This is going to help them continue on with those functions. This is a natural progression. It is necessary and proper for the U.S. Constitution or the U.S. government to create a Bank of the United States according to Hamilton and the other Federalists. And this is known as the Elastic Clause, that the U.S. Constitution should be able to be stretched and uh, molded and shaped as uh, American society changes. So this is really one of the major debates between Hamilton and Jefferson, whether or not the U.S. Constitution should be a fluid document or whether it should be a stable document and leave more of that power up to the states. Now, there was also a split not just between the Federalists and the uh, Republicans, but also a split between the North and the South. Uh, the, in the North, there was more commercial businesses, more shipping, etc., that would have benefited from a Bank of the United States, whereas the South, which was more agrarian, uh, felt that it would only benefit uh, those Northern industrialists. But even with this division between North and South, between Federalists and uh, uh, Republicans, George Washington still signed the Bank of the United States into law, and it was chartered for the first 20 years, and this will be an issue later on when we get to um, uh, Andrew Jackson. Now, back to that excise tax that had been uh, called on whiskey and other domestic products as well. Um, in the United States, there was a group of farmers, particularly in southwestern Pennsylvania, a group of farmers who were growing corn and wheat and other things. Now, to them, they did not have proper roads in order to get their uh, agricultural products to market, so many of these farmers then converted their crop into whiskey. Well, now there is an excise tax, or a tax on domestic goods, meaning d goods made within the United States. 
to these whiskey distillers, this is against their liberty. They said, what was the reason for going through this revolutionary war if all of a sudden we now have to start paying taxes again? We got rid of King George uh, III in the revolution. We don't want another King George. And so a whiskey rebellion started up in western Pennsylvania among these whiskey distillers, angry that they had to pay this tax. They raised liberty poles like what had been done during the Stamp Act, uh, and they tarred and feathered uh, these collectors, much like we'd seen during the Stamp Act crisis. Now, George Washington, as President of the United States, also serves as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, meaning he is the head of the Army. From George Washington's perspective, this rebellion was not legitimate. His perspective was, you have voted on representatives to Congress, both senators and uh, congressmen. You therefore have had a say in government. Our problem before was not the taxation. It was the fact that we'd had no taxation without representation. You now have representation. Therefore, this Whiskey Rebellion is ridiculous. And so George Washington called from the surrounding states an army to be raised. Now, here is a critical moment in American history because people actually showed up. The U.S. Constitution is actually working. George Washington, as commander-in-chief, has called together an army to put down this rebellion, and surrounding states have actually sent men to serve in this army. They are following the U.S. Constitution, and it is actually working. The Whiskey Rebellion is important for that exact reason. It is among the top of the among the top of the rebellions. Obviously, Bacon's Rebellion, Shay's Rebellion, and now the Whiskey Rebellion. And so leading this army, uh, George Washington personally led the troops to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, the Whiskey Boys, as they were called, uh, scared that the President of the United States and a huge army was marching on them, uh, actually disbanded prior to them actually uh, showing up. They were fearful of the troops. Um, but what this means is that the federal government is strong and that it's actually working, unlike what we'd seen under the Articles of Confederation. And here you see George Washington commanding his troops as he marches on the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, as far as foreign uh, issues are concerned, that Franco-American alliance that had been created in 1778 uh, during the American Revolution was supposed to be forever binding, meaning we had agreed to be in an alliance with France for forever. Uh, and the Democratic Republicans, uh, led by uh, Thomas Jefferson, really sided with the French, especially when the French Revolution uh, was starting up. From Jefferson's perspective, the French Revolution was just another example of the common people demanding um, the right to govern themselves. Now, obviously, it took a turn for the worse, but from the Democratic Republicans' perspective, they wanted to join in this revolutionary fervor um, to bring an end to the monarchy, etc., now, from Washington's perspective as the president, to him, it's in the United States' best interest to avoid war at all costs. We are far too unsteady of a country at this point in order to get involved in other countries' problems, other countries' issues. And so in 1793... Uh, the United States created the Neutrality Proclamation. This officially declares our neutrality uh, without the consent of uh, Congress, that we are going to remain isolationist unless it is, it is within our self-interest. We had no stake in the game to deal with France at this time. The United States would have gotten nothing out of this had we gone and, and uh, assisted with this French Revolution. So therefore, we were remaining neutral. Um, and as a result of this neutrality proclamation, uh, the United States actually benefited because we were able to continue trading with the French West Indies. Now, other issues rose up during Washington's uh, term in office, particularly when it comes to Great Britain. Now, the uh, Treaty of Paris, which had ended the American Revolution, uh, had said that the British were going to remove their troops from the Northwest Territory um, along the borders between Canada and the United States, um, etc. Now, that had not happened yet, and that's going to be an issue all the way up until the War of 1812. Another major problem that was going on beyond that was that uh, British ships were impressing American sailors, meaning they were boarding American ships and literally kidnapping American sailors and forcing them into the service of the British Navy or onto British ships. So John Jay was sent to Great Britain in order to deal with this issue, to try to come to a resolution over these issues. 
Alexander Hamilton, who remember part of his economic plan is about dealing with um, dealing with Great Britain on a regular basis, his entire economic plan would fall apart had Jay's treaty not gone the way he wanted to. So uh, Alexander Hamilton kind of gave the heads up to Great Britain prior to John Jay getting there, saying, here's his plan. Here's what he's looking to do. And so when Jay's treaty was done being negotiated, it was very, it looked very much like the United States and Great Britain were, again, best friends again. Uh, the British agreed to leave the Northwest Post, which they did not do once again. Um, and the Americans, or and they also promised to pay for the damages to any of those seized ships uh, that they had seized during the impressment of the sailors. However, the Americans promised to repay the debts that are still owed to Great Britain. So from a Southerner's perspective, this is a terrible uh, treaty because the Southerners are the ones who primarily owe all of the debt to Great Britain, whereas the Northerners are the ones who own the ships who are getting their payment back. So way back here in the, in the late 1700s, we're already starting to see a division between North and South, and more so just than over the issue of slavery. Add to that Pinckney's Treaty of 1795. This was a treaty with Spain. Now, Spain, who at this time controls the Mississippi River and uh, the northern territory of Florida, they see Jay's Treaty as a sign that the United States and Great Britain are about to announce a formal alliance. Now, Spain is not worried at all about the United States. They're not worried about our military prowess at this time. But they are worried about Great Britain. And so Pinckney's Treaty is kind of a random treaty because the Spanish, um, fearful of an American-British alliance, gave the United States free access to use the Mississippi River and also that disputed territory in the northern portion of Florida. Now, this is going to change later on once the French regain control of the Mississippi River, but for the time being, it allows those western farmers to get their products to market by floating it down the Mississippi River. And finally, after two terms in office, uh, George Washington voluntarily chooses to leave office, thus setting the two, -term president, uh, two terms in office precedence that every president has followed up until Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in his farewell address to the United States, uh, Washington uh, warned America to avoid permanent alliances in the future, that only in the issues of uh, extraordinary emergencies should the United States ever enter into an alliance to avoid these entangling alliances uh, as we have seen with France. Now following uh, George Washington, his vice president John Adams um, comes into power, but it is not as easily one of a contest as we've seen with George Washington who was unanimously elected. Um, John Adams is a Federalist um, versus Thomas Jefferson, who is the Democratic Republican. Um, the problem is, though, that when the U.S. Constitution was written, they had never factored in the idea of factions or political parties. And so they had said whoever comes in first will become president, and whoever comes in second will become vice president. And so with that, John Adams, who won 71 electoral votes, became the President of the United States. And his opposition, Thomas Jefferson, became his Vice President with 68 uh, electoral votes. It doesn't really spell a whole lot of success for John Adams' this term in office, seeing as though his opposition is now his Vice President. And also, uh, most of Washington's cabinet, who were loyal to Hamilton and actually hated John Adams, left when Washington or I'm sorry, where he was left with Washington's cabinet, most of whom were loyal to Alexander Hamilton. And so poor John Adams, who really did not have much of a chance of success for his term in office, uh, is surrounded by his enemies. And one of the first issues that he had to deal with was the issue of France. Now, France, angry over Jay's treaty and the fact that we'd completely ignored the Franco-American alliance, began seizing American ships. Now, John Adams sent uh, a, a set of diplomats to France, including John Marshall, who is going to make a name for himself in the years to come, to France in order to try to avoid war. The problem is that when John Marshall got to France, he was intercepted by three anonymous men who became known publicly as X, Y, and Z. 
X, Y, and Z basically told John Marshall, if you want to meet with uh, Talleyrand, who was the French foreign minister at the time, even if you just want to have a meeting with Talleyrand, you must pay us a bribe of $250,000. Now, this bribe did not actually determine whether or not they would uh, get a favorable response from Talleyrand. All it meant was that they couldn't meet, he couldn't meet with Talleyrand. And so angry at this, uh, John Marshall completely refused this bribe and returned home, uh, declaring that we will pay millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. Tribute means uh, booty or um, a bribe. And so because of this and this anger aimed at France, uh, we engaged in an undeclared war with France between 1798 and 1800, most of it being engaged on the high seas. Now, this did not really help out the Democratic Republicans cause much, seeing as though Jefferson and the other Democratic Republicans had sided with France in the years previous to this. And here you see a political cartoon of uh, the French uh, X, Y, and Z picking the pockets of the American uh, Lady Liberty right there. <laughs> 